So how is it out there? It, it is uh, interesting right now. Uh, as you know, I travel around with Josh Sowards and uh, uh, certainly Patrick Reinhardt, two of my real good friends. And we all discuss in the Wally Wagon what is out there. And this morning on the way in, Josh was saying, well, John, how come nobody talks about the fact that we're reaching a tipping point in this country? And I said, well, I talk about it a lot, and I think uh, a lot of people in Washington are starting to look at it. And it's when your national debt, which is $16 trillion, starts to equal what you produce in the country, which is called the gross, gross domestic product. So you're looking at a $16 trillion debt and a $16 trillion gross domestic product, and that's called a tipping point, and we're at a tipping point right now. Greece has already been through that tipping point, and Spain obviously has also been through that tipping point, and now it's the United States' turn. The question then becomes, what are we going to do about it? Right, what's your answer? What are we going to do about it? Well, I I think the first thing we have to do, Hoppy, is that you have to look at what is mandated uh, and is coming at us. It's Obamacare, which is the largest single expenditure out there. Um, A lot of forecasts that I see look at it at almost $3 trillion worth of... uh, worth of debt that's going to be added to $16 trillion. That's just not acceptable. And the question becomes, are we going to look at socialized medicine versus free market medicine? I think I know which I'm for, free market medicine. That would be the first thing that I would look at and first thing that I would try to cut. John, I want to get to back to yeah. Obamacare in a minute. Yeah. But, but a lot of the real money is in Medicare right. and Social Security and defense, more so those first two. So let's talk about those two. I mean, what, well, what, what do you think we should do about I, Medicare? Can I uh, include a third one in that? Sure. It's Medicaid, Medicare, and Social sure. Security. That's sure. 47% of our budget. Uh, the Defense Department doesn't even approach any of these numbers, and the Defense Department budgets aren't what are called runaway budgets. These are runaway budgets that don't really seem to have an end in sight. But, you know, when I look at it, I look like at a business problem, and a business problem, let's look at Social Security right off the bat. Uh, we started with 16 retirees supporting what? One. Uh, I mean, 16 workers, excuse so me. Supporting one person. Retirement. Yeah. And today we're looking at three uh, supporting one worker. Well, there's a problem there, isn't there? Why aren't people working? Uh, my solution is very much a supply side. I'd like to get more people supporting that one retiree. You know, when you have 25 million people out of work, there's something wrong there, isn't there? Uh, when you look at the size of debt that we have, and certainly when let's go to Medicare and let's go to uh, Medicaid, if we want these programs, which I think America does, and I'm, I'm, I'm confident that they do, then we're going to have to do without other programs. And when I say do without other programs, let's look at the cause and the effect of what we could do. And you've heard me a hundred times talk about the Department of Education. Do we really need that? Do we really need the Department of Energy? I don't think we do. Do we need EPA when you have a Department of Environmental Protection in each state. You can pick up the redundancies of this country federally versus states when states have lost their states' rights and when federal mandates take over to the tune of what's going on in this country. We all want these social programs. Are we willing to pay for them? No, but we seem to be willing to go in debt for them. I don't agree with that philosophy. So before we can do anything, we have to start cutting and trimming uh, the size of government in this country, which we have not done. We have not done that over the last two years, three years, 20 years, wherever you want to go. It's just been expanding. Our gross domestic product in this country is only half of what the spending is. And the problem in this country is not how much we tax. Joe always likes to talk about everyone's got to pay their fair share. I think Obama says the same thing. What our problem is is spending. Let me let me go back, though, to Social Security. Yeah. Because... John, I don't think that you can fix Social Security by not doing one of a couple things, and that is you either got a lower benefit or you – and I think you're right about putting more people to work so you get more money into the system. But still with the baby boomers getting ready to retire, right. don't you have to get more money in the system or, or raise the retirement age or, or prorate even more the benefit? Don't you have to do something structural like that? Well, there are all kinds of ideas out there, but if you want to look at the big idea, I always, I always look at the, what we can do is immediate. And to me, you said it, we have to get more money into the system. Uh, And right now, it's just hand to mouth. There is no individual retirement accounts because we just have tremendous debt levels against Social Security. So there's two things that you can do. You can certainly raise the amount of people working, which is something that I call growing the economy. But there's also something else that I think about our debts in general that we can do. This country owns more land than any other country in the world. In other words, we have a tremendous amount of of land that the the federal government owns, a lot of oil leases that the government owns, a lot of natural uh, petroleum interests that the government owns. 
why don't we disperse of some of this government property? Sell the property. Sell the property. And what does that do? We sell it to the private sector. And what does that do? It causes and creates jobs. It creates tax base. It creates a lot of things. But for government to be in the land ownership business, I'm not saying natural national parks or anything like that. I'm talking about the vast holdings that they have. Right now, the biggest problem, and even Hillary Clinton says this, is our national debt. So we have debt problems and we have deficit problems. We've got two things coming at us. So where where do you start first? John Racy is with us, Republican candidate for U.S. Senate. John, let me take a step back and talk about philosophy. And I know that you are um, you are a free market conserv you are a conservative free market capitalist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what d does business, in your opinion, does business have a role or responsibility beyond to its employees? beyond the, 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 the tax rate that it's going to pay and, the, you know, the rules has to follow, uh, the shareholders, does it have any response, responsibility beyond that? Is there such a thing, in your view, as corporate or business responsibility beyond what that business does? Does it have a responsibility to the community? Does it have mm -hmm. a responsibility, a larger responsibility to, um, to anything beyond that? Well, I, I think it always does, and I think capitalism requires the limitation of government powers to maximize the freedom of an individual, and that's the first and only definition of capitalism and free enterprise. But when you have an asset, for instance, Greer, Greer Industries has many assets. How many jobs, how many lives, how many tax bases, it all goes into one. So when you have a job at Greer Industries, people pay taxes, people send their children to school, people support the community, and that's how it all is supposed to work. Is that responsibility beyond uh, what we do? Yes, it is. I, I've been in West Virginia for a heck of a long time, and so has my family, and I think we have corporate responsibility. I know we have corporate responsibility because in our government, in free enterprise and capitalism, this is how it works, and you can see in examples of it. It's what my grandmother and grandfather did for hundreds of years, literally, is supply that tax base and supply living base and supply the, the living base of hundreds and hundreds of people. Good stuff. John, when you call for the elimination of the EPA, mm -hmm. do you think there are people out there that hear that and go, wow, that sounds pretty, that sounds pretty um, radical? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think people right now are going to have to start really, as I said earlier, figuring out what government organizations do we want. Let me give you an example. Do you want Medicare? Do you want Medicaid? Or do you want the EPA? But I think I know the answer to that. But, and and I, I rip the EPA all the time, especially yeah. this EPA. But if you eliminate the entire EPA, right. you're not going to have enough money to fix Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. I mean, the money just, just isn't there. Yeah, I think that's just one element. That's one element. Uh, let's take a look at uh, the uh, IRS, for instance. If we eliminate the IRS and have a simplistic way of paying our taxes, somewhat like Mr. Forbes put with a, a flat like a flat tax. tax? Yeah. You eliminate how many IRS agents? 100,000. When you eliminate the Department of Education, what are you looking? That's $80 billion per annum. When you look at the Department of Energy, $40 billion per annum. And as Everett Dirksen used to put it, a million here and a million there, pretty soon it adds up to a little bit of money. But when you, when you look at the redundancy, and this is important to say, when I, when I say EPA, do we have a, an environmental protection agency inside the state of West Virginia? Do we have a Department of Education inside the state of West Virginia? Everything that you look at federally, you can sort of handle by the states. I'm a states' rightist. I believe in states' right, local government, local education, local environmental control. There's nothing wrong with, you know, regulations if the regulations coincide and exist with business for the betterment of our world. That's all. John Race is with us, Republican candidate for U.S. Senate. How much, how much of your hatred of the EPA – hatred might be the wrong word. How much of your – Hatred what, is the wrong word. Okay. What would you – all right. <laughs> how much of your uh, disdain for the EPA is rooted in um, your experience as a businessman and your ongoing dispute with the EPA – over uh, permits at, at, and, and uh, wetlands at Pikewood. Well, it's interesting uh, you bring that up. Uh, we, we have gone through and we've had inspections. It's not like the EPA has never been up to Pikewood. It's been something that's been going on for quite a while. Our contention is our argument is over what is called a 404 statute. Uh, and it was explained to us that we don't qualify for that because we're not at a certain uh, elevation level. And that was given to us by the EPA. So... Uh, we've asked for mediation. They've drug it out and drug it out and drug it out. So 
It's just working with uh, a government organization. Uh, to me, I think government should try to help the private sector. We should try to help the environment, should try to help this world. But when you look at the adversarial position, certainly under the Obama administration, I'm not saying the Bush administration is any far better or worse. I'm just saying it comes a time in our lives right now, and especially here in West Virginia, that we have to make up our minds the path that we want to follow, and we also have to make up our path that we're going to follow for the next 60 years because this election is about the next 60 years, not about the next six years. John, you're a, a deficit, uh, a hawk, a budget hawk. Uh, are there instances where – let me give you a hypothetical. Let's say that, that uh, we have a balanced budget, a constitutional amendment, what you want, a balanced budget amendment. Right. So required of a balanced budget. And then, God forbid, something terrible happens. We're attacked, and we, right. must, and we must respond. Right. And to do so is going to be expensive, perhaps even an invasion of another country. These things happen. We know from recent history. Would at that point, would you favor deficit spending in times of national emergency? It's sort of like in business, Hoppy. When I look at my uh, uh, different holdings that I have, I have divisions. I have different, uh, different arenas that I have to entertain and have to look at to be competitive. You can't sit back and make a budget without putting, for instance, what you said, national defense in. Now, Obama and Manchin right now want to take a trillion dollars out of our national defense. How many times have I said that's wrong? Because that's not responsible to our people. And when you look at a budget, a budget has to be put together in a fashion that protects. That's the number one thing that this country has to do. And to quote Ronald Reagan, government's first duty is to protect the people, not run their lives. That has to be in the budget. So it wouldn't be a surprise to me. It's like something I'm very interested in. is called SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, which puts a blanket of lasers around our country to protect us. We have the, we have the technology right now. But, you know, obviously, uh, under Bill Clinton, it was terminated. So I look at problems. I look at budgets. I look at a way out in front of me, not right up next to me, right in front of my nose. And I think that's what's, you know, obviously been going on for this country for a last 20 to 25 years. John, staying on national defense, mm -hmm. uh, Kentucky Republican Senator Rand Paul's running ads now in West Virginia mm -hmm. uh, against Joe Manchin because uh, uh, Rand Paul had an amendment that called for stopping <clears throat> our federal aid to Pakistan, Libya, and Egypt. It was defeated, I think, 81 to 10. A lot of Republicans voted against it, in fact. And, and Rand Paul took Manchin to task for supporting uh, that uh, for opposing that amendment. How would you have voted on that amendment? Well, I would have been one of those 10, make it number 11. Uh, I think that when you look at foreign aid, and once again, let me keep bringing up the subject of Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security, if we have $4 billion to waste to send to the Muslim of Brotherhood, I think I have better reasons and better options than to do that. Uh, it's how we spend our money in Congress, and this is a typical example of Joe Manchin being on the wrong team. And when leaders of your party say do something, then he has to react. You notice that the 10 that voted against this particular situation aren't a party of any team. That's the group that I'd like to be with. Well, Lindsey Graham, who is a prominent Republican in the Senate, came out mm -hmm. and supported Manchin for his stand, a Republican. I mean, oh, what happened? I, I'm completely aware of it, but, you know, I trust no man whose hips are wider than his shoulders, Lindsey Graham. It's kind of a cheap shot, isn't it, John? <laughs> Where, um, what do you think your chances are? I think my chances are very good. Uh, it's a very tough race, and I, I don't know of anybody in the United States today, whether you're looking at a, a poll from um, uh, uh, certainly Romney and Obama to a poll between Manchin and I, that could ever predict who's going to win any of these races because it's a volatile electorate out there. There's no question about it. And uh, I, I feel, Liz and I both feel very confident there's a lot of people going to walk in that voting booth November 6th or obviously starting here October the 24th with a different attitude. I think a lot of people have seen uh, the deceitfulness and the, the ads that are right there, out right now that are not truthful about, you know, a lot of things that are going on in the state of West Virginia. I almost have to laugh at Joe Manchin the other day puts an ad out where he has stopped cap and trade. You know, people have to understand that Joe Manchin didn't get to Washington until late in the fall. Cap and trade was stopped way back in August. He had nothing to do with it. But what is scary right now is the fact that we put Obama in there for four more years and certainly Joe Manchin in for another six. That team will bring up cap and trade once again. I'll assure you of that. 
And I hate to say which way Joe Manchin will have to vote because he is a member of that team. John Racy, U.S. Senate candidate. John, good to see you. Thank you very much, Hop.